Father, once again, we count it a privilege to come to you. Uh, Lord, as we look at the world around us, we see a lot of turmoil uh, with our upcoming elections, with our two candidates, we see a lot of turmoil. Uh, Lord, we don't, you know, we don't want to vote for a personality, but Lord, we pray for those that uh, have the right uh, policies that we can get behind. And I pray, Father, that you would lead us and direct us by your Holy Spirit. And Father, I ask that you would uh, have your hand upon Israel and the people of Israel. We do once again pray that many there in Israel would come to know Jesus as their Messiah. And Lord, we know that things are going to go from difficult to worse in uh, the coming weeks, months, years. We're not sure when, but uh, we know Ezekiel 38, 39 has not yet happened. But we pray, Father, for uh, the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, Lord, for um, the people here in our nation. Uh, we seem to be turning our back on you more and more, and so I pray that you would uh, quicken our hearts. Uh, you would challenge us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would bring heavy conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment upon the people of our nation. And Lord, uh, we, we need a revival because without you, Lord, we are toast. And so, Father, we just ask that you would give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us from your living word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So turn to Acts chapter 4. Um, as you're turning there, once again, more and more people in our country are passing laws that are just crazy. Laws that go against uh, the Word of God. Freedom of speech is certainly being redefined throughout the land. It's okay for humanists, atheists, alternative lifestyle advocates to spew out their unintelligent, unscientific, unproven theories about the origin of life, the meaning of life. What is the acceptable lifestyle among the sexes? But for a Christian to say, stand up and say, well, God's word says that that lifestyle is sin, and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Well, you're going to be labeled a religious fanatic or a narrow-minded bigot. You'll be intolerant. Uh, you're intolerant of <laughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion. All I can say about that is everyone is equal in the eyes of God. Equity is not biblical. Equality is what God looks at the heart. He doesn't care about the outward appearance. It doesn't matter what color or what background you're from. He looks at the heart, and every one of us is a sinner before we get saved. And so he wants all to come to Jesus for salvation. That's where you will have equality with your brothers and sisters throughout the world when we come to Jesus. But things have really become crazy and reinterpreted over the last 15 or 20 years. But the Lord and His Word do not change um, but we're seeing God kicked out of more and more of our institutions. And, you know, from federal government to state and local government, God has given little more than lip service by our leaders, even both candidates right now, give lip service to God. I hope they come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But no longer is God revered and honored and sought after like He once was. Uh, today there are dozens of groups who seem to have one ambition in mind, and that is in the name of fairness and tolerance and protection. We must stop the, the narrow-minded fundamentalists um, who are trying to force their God and their Jesus down our throats. Well, that's not what we're doing. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. But churches are under tremendous pressure today to compromise God's word, to stop preaching the gospel and be more open-minded about sin in other words, we should be more like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Or we should be more like the people in the day of the book of Judges, where everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And unfortunately, many churches are buckling under the pressure. In order not to offend anyone, a lot of churches will no longer talk about sin and their need for repentance. Those are too negative. We want to be a positive church. Well, all I can say is that we are all positively sinners by birth, and by action, and Jesus positively died on the cross and shed his blood for our sins. He was positively buried in the tomb, and he positively rose from the dead. He is positively going to come back and judge this world, and he is going to set up his kingdom on the earth. So we can be positive about that, but we're not going to be just a positive church that never talks about sin. Now, it does matter, or I should say it does not matter, that society continues to change because Jesus and his word never change. 
It never changes. God is the same. He doesn't change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus says. My word will endure forever. Now, when we saw Jesus commissioning his disciples to preach the gospel to all people, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we saw last time that the leaders there in Israel were hostile to the gospel. Uh, they threatened Peter and John, said, Do not speak or teach any more in that name. Don't talk about Jesus. So, how is this early church going to fulfill the Great Commission? When every political, every social, every religious power was against them, very simple, they would pray, they would seek God, and they would obey the Lord. They would do what God called them to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. They knew it wasn't a physical or political battle. They knew it was a spiritual battle. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal or physical weapons, but spiritual weapons of God's truth, of His Word, prayer, using the sword of the Spirit correctly, and seeking God for boldness and for opportunities to share the, uh, God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They knew that the gospel of Christ is the only means of salvation. That's what Paul says in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to us Greeks, Gentiles. So they were not going to be intimidated by the threats of those that were in charge. They were determined to be faithful and stay faithful to Jesus because he told them what to do. And they're like, okay, Lord, but we can't do it in our own strength. And so that's why he gave them the Holy Spirit. And so that kept them dependent on Jesus at all times. Rather than coming up with their own formulas, with their own methods of how to win the world for Christ, they simply listened to and obeyed the gospel. And that simple dependency upon Jesus Christ is what we all need to get back to. We don't need special Jesus days or Jesus marches. We don't need to be pumped up by worldly things. We need to simply humble ourselves before God every day, cry out to God for more power, more love, more strength, more grace. We need to not only get us through this day in the power of the Lord, but to give us victory throughout the day. But we have to be dependent on Him. Don't look to the government to be the answer. Donald Trump is not the answer. I'm going to vote for him, but he's not the answer. The answer is Jesus. If you're looking to Donald Trump or Kamala or whoever else, you're missing the boat because they are not going to save you. They're not going to save this nation. They might delay the inevitable, but the inevitable is every nation but Israel will be judged by God. So get that through your heads. We need to be light and salt to the world around us while we still have time. So after being threatened by the Sanhedrin to stop preaching and teaching about Jesus, John and Peter are released, and this is where we pick up. Look at chapter 4, verse 30, or 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. In other words, they get there and they say, you should have heard what they told us. They said we couldn't tell anybody about Jesus. The religious leaders said we can't talk about Jesus anymore. They told us to be quiet. So what do you think they did? Did they march around the temple with picket signs? No. Did they chain themselves to olive trees? No. What did they do? They came together. They called out to the living God. Look at verse 24. So when they, so the churches gathered together, when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. What a novel idea. Let's seek first the kingdom of God. Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. So again, they first of all acknowledge God as the one supreme authority over all things. He is the creator of all things. And so they acknowledge him that he is the sustainer of life. He is infinitely higher, more powerful than any human government or power or agency. And so they turn to God first and foremost. That's a good lesson for all of us. Where do you turn when the enemy attacks? Where do you turn when you go through a trial? Where do you turn when the world comes against you? 
We need to come to Jesus first and foremost. Now notice how their minds flash to Psalm verse, uh, Psalm chapter 2. This is a psalm that speaks of the heathen nations that desire to be free from God. They want to be free from God's law. They want to put off all shackles of God. And they also, it's a psalm about the ultimate victory in Jesus. Now, okay, let me just read this. Verse 25, Who by the mouth of your servant David, this is all part of their prayer, have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. Now, turn with me to Psalm chapter 2. It's not on the screen, so you actually have to turn in your Bibles. It's always fun to listen to Bible pages turning. So please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 2. We'll go through this quickly. They, they quote from the first two verses of Psalm 2. And so, it's the Psalm, again, David wrote, he said, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. That's not it. That's Psalm 3. Psalm 2. <laughs> Move over to the next page. Why do the nations rage? It's like, that doesn't sound right. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, so in, in, in uh, Acts 4, they say against the, his Christ. So the word here is anointed. It's Mashiach in, in the Hebrew, which is the Christ, the, the Messiah, the anointed one. And so why are they taking counsel against Yahweh, the Lord, and the Messiah? Here's the Father and Son in the Old Testament. Let us break their bonds. So this is the world around us. Let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from among us. In other words, we don't want to be tied down by God and by Jesus and by the Bible. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king, again Jesus, on my holy hill of Zion. And he's going to move to the millennial reign of Christ here in a moment. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And that's what we see in the book of Revelation. When Jesus returns, he will destroy his enemies. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. This would be a good thing for both presidential candidates to put on their desk and read this every morning. Therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way, when His wrath is kindled out a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in Him. And so we need to keep our trust in the Lord. So back here in Acts 4, they quote the first two verses there from Psalm 2, and then they pray in verse 27, For truly against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. So who put Jesus on the cross? Everybody, you and me. It was our sins. Ultimately, it was the Father. Reads Isaiah 53. It was the Father's good pleasure to bruise him. It was because of our sins that Jesus went to the cross. And here he points out Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So here they're calling out to the Lord. They recognize God is sovereign. He is in control. He's over the whole situation. These threats didn't catch God off guard. It was all part of his plan. This is part of his purpose. He wanted to draw all the disciples together he wanted them to look to Him for strength, look to Him for wisdom, look to Him for encouragement. A couple Old Testament scriptures that are important. Isaiah 45, 7 is where God says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. 
I, the Lord, do all these things. Amos 3, 6. If a, trumpet's in the, uh, if a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? Because usually it was a sign, oh, we're being attacked. If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? In other words, God is in control. He allows certain things to take place in our lives for a reason. So when something happens in my life that I don't quite understand, rather than getting all upset and getting concerned and worried, I just need to call upon the Lord. I need to trust Him. I need to commit these things to Him. I don't know I have to understand everything, but I do understand He loves me. I understand He wants what's best for me. I understand that the ways of this world are against me, but God is for me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So when something's going on and you don't understand, just fall to fall upon the Lord. Start worshiping Him. Get into His Word, and, and you're promised that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You're familiar with this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation, that means a test, a trial, a struggle you're going through, has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. In other words, you're not going to be tempted beyond what you're able to endure with the help of Jesus. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So he reminds me that he's in control. He reminds me he's my shepherd. He's my protector. He is my fortress. And all the things this world has against me should do nothing but drive me closer to the Lord. Satan wants you to think when something bad is going on in your life, oh, God doesn't love you anymore. You messed up. You might as well throw in the towel. You might as well turn back to the drinking, the drugs, or whatever it might be that used to get you through life. That's the lie of the enemy. God allows things in our lives that, want, that should encourage us, draw near to the Lord. Cast all your cares upon Him, knowing that He cares for you. And that is what we see happening to the disciples as they call out to God. God will always give us a way out of whatever problem we face, or He will get us through it with Him walking beside us. He's not always going to say, okay, now it's gone, you're, everything's going to be happy. But he'll be there walking through you, whatever you're going through, because he is faithful. Look at verses 29 and 30. This is their specific, specific prayer request. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness, <laughs> I love this, that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I mean, this is a, an amazing prayer because this is a gracious prayer right here. You know, they didn't ask God, okay, God, raise up your hand, kick them in the teeth, knock out their teeth. Yeah, David prayed that sometimes, but that's a whole different story. But they're praying for mercy. They're praying for grace. They're like, Lord, stretch out your hand, heal them, show them that you love them. Show them that you are a gracious, merciful God. You don't desire to crush them, but you want them, uh, want them healed. You want them forgiven. That it might be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I mean, this is wonderful evidence that their hearts were knit together with the heart of Jesus because this is exactly what Jesus said. This is what he, how he told us to pray. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, look at this verse here. But I say to you, Love your enemies. Really, Kamala? Come on! No, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. <laughs> ah, that's a tough one. I've had people get in my face or curse me out, and it's like, ugh, the old me would have attacked. He says, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Again, that's exactly what Jesus did. He demonstrated it. First thing, after they nail him to the cross, they raise up the cross. And what is the first thing out of his mouth? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, not only was this a gracious prayer, but it's also a prayer of faith. It's a prayer of confidence in the Lord. 
They're not asking for the persecution to stop. They don't pray that at all. What they're asking for is that the Lord would give them more boldness. The very thing that got them in trouble in the first place because they were bold in their witness of Jesus. So they're not like, oh, we pray for protection. No, it's like, give us more boldness. They threatened us. We want to be more bold about Jesus, about the Lord. They knew that now was not the time to run and hide because they were being threatened. That's what they did after Jesus was arrested, as they're getting ready to crucify him. They all ran. They all hid. But now it's after Pentecost. The Spirit is in them. The Spirit is upon them. And now they want boldness to be a light, to be salt to the world around them. Be bold in your witness. Stand up for Jesus Christ. We need to remember what Paul told his son in the faith. We call him timid, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, where Paul says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. A sound mind doesn't mean you go over there and beat people up with your Bible. That's just ridiculous but to speak the truth in love. Now, these saints were not praying for persecution to stop, and they're not even praying for persecution. I've had some people say, bring it on! It's like, what? I don't pray for persecution. I don't want to be persecuted. But he'll give you the strength if you are, but they're not praying for that. They're asking God to give them greater courage to stand up for Jesus as persecution got worse. And that should be our prayer today because I can guarantee persecution is going to get worse in our nation. Next four years, maybe, but it's coming. I want to be the kind of Christian that stands up for Jesus, that honors Him in all that I do. Now, some of you know A.W. Tozer. He passed away a little over 60 years ago. A very powerful Man of God, he, he spoke the truth. He spoke it in love. But he wrote this pamphlet, and it's called Chocolate Soldiers. Um, this is the quote. Chocolate soldiers are Christians who love to be wrapped in dainty tissue papers and who love to be protected in a shiny heart-shaped box but melt at the first sign of heat. End quote. I love chocolate but I don't want to be chocolate. You know, I love to eat chocolate, but I don't want to become a chocolate soldier when the heat gets turned up and you just melt away. If Tozer was alive today, I'm sure he would be shocked by all the melting Christians in America today. We're seeing so-called Christians falling, withering all around us. They're walking away from the Bible. They're walking away from their morals. They're walking away from their marriages. They're walking away from their commitment to Christ. They're compromising with the world. And often it's because of peer pressure, social media, bad doctrine. They're, you know, just falling for the lies of the enemy. But it's nothing new. Jesus spoke of this in the parable of the sower. You know, it gives us that parable where there's four types of soil. And this is speaking of the second type, the shallow, rocky soil. Matthew 13, verse 20. But he who received the seed on the stony places, that's the word, the seed, on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Oh, this is great. Jesus is going to make my life better. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, because you're being light and salt, immediately he stumbles. They, they just kind of wither and fade away. So a great prayer here. Uh, they didn't ask God to stop it, but they prayed for strength. Jesus promised them that you're going to be persecuted and us, uh, John 16, 33. This is what Jesus says. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you'll have peace. You'll have peace if you're in Christ. In the world you'll have tribulation, struggles, hardships, difficulties. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, this is awesome, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, 
And they were all filled, notice they're all filled with the Holy Spirit, including Peter and John, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So God quickly answers this prayer. Some prayers are answered over time. This was an immediate response from the Lord. And I believe this prayer was answered so quickly because their hearts were lined up with God's heart. God wanted them to share the love of Jesus, the gospel of Christ to a lost, dying world around them. And that's exactly what they were praying for. Lord, give us boldness to speak your word. Help us to love our enemies. Stretch out your hand to heal, to touch those around us. We need to heal the brokenhearted, set liberty those who are captive and so forth. And so, Lord, use us today. All they wanted, when you think about it, is to be more like Jesus. That's what God wants. He wants all of us to be more like Jesus. And the Father, He responds here, Yes, that's what I want to hear from my children. They want to be more like Jesus. They want to be more like my Son. He's the head, we're the body. He wants us to be more like Him. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, there's many fillings as Christians. They were all filled on the day of Pentecost. And when they're all filled, it says they all spoke in tongues. Here, they're all filled, and now they're going to speak in, with boldness. We see this. Peter, back in chapter 3, it says in Peter and John, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gives a defense for the hope that's in him. We'll see this throughout the book of Acts. And being filled, that's what it means, literally. Being filled or refilled at that moment to do what God's called you to do. Sometimes we grieve the Spirit. Sometimes we quench the Spirit. He's always in us. But He wants us overflowing with rivers of living water. And here, they're filled up overflowing. We also see in this verse the importance of assembling together. In other words, it's vital that we get together as followers of Jesus. God does not endorse Lone Ranger Christianity. Again, we are the body of Christ. He is the head, and we're the various parts of the body. Look at these verses in 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 15. The Apostle Paul writes, If the foot should say, Because I am not a, a, a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course not. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? That, that, visualize that. The whole thing was an eye. You just picture North Avenue, all these big giant eyeballs rolling down the street. That just made no sense. It'd just be weird. He says, if the whole were hearing, just you know, a big ear laying there, where would be the smelling? You know, a giant nose hobbling down the road. But now God has set the members... That's each one of us, each one of them in the body just as he pleased. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. In other words, we all need each other. There are no unimportant parts to the body of Christ. And it's only when we are with our brothers and sisters in Christ that we can experience, what is it, 31 one another's in the Scriptures, the New Testament, like love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, comfort one another, bless one another. Here's a couple more in Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another. This is why we get together. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now, we want to encourage each other in these things. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Remember, COVID was trying to keep us from gathering together. But exhorting one another, that's part of it. We exhort, we encourage, we you know, say, Hey, brother, hey, sister, I love you, so stop doing this. Brother, sister, I love you, so I want to encourage you, keep doing that. We've got to exhort one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, the day when Christ comes for His bride, the day when Jesus returns, we want to stir each other up. Look at verse 32. Now, all, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Now, 
This is not a verse that encourages communism. You know, uh, Bernie Sanders might like that verse, but he'll take it out of context. You know, this is a very unique time in the early church. It was a very short-lived time. Nobody was co coerced into giving. Nobody was made to give. Nobody was required to give. They were now filled with the Spirit of God. They had God's love in their hearts. And remember what I said a few weeks ago, when these, and these are all Jews getting saved for about the first 10 years or so, they were only Jews coming to Jesus. And many times when these Jewish people came to Jesus, their non-believing relatives, co-workers, bosses, would cut them off. You're not part of our family anymore. You're following this false Messiah. You don't belong here in this job anymore. So they were cut off. They had nothing. And so they had to lean on each other. We see this in Northeast India all the time with our tribal groups, sometimes the Muslim groups. They get saved and they're cut off from their families. The village will run them out of town. And so we have other Christians that come alongside. And this very thing still happens. People come along and they want to bless them, encourage them, get them back on their feet. And that's what we see happening here. When you realize that everything you have comes from God, then you don't have to stress about everything. You just thank Him for the blessings He's given you, and, and then you use what He's given you to bless others. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Verse 33 I love this verse. It says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Notice how grace and power go together. A lot of people in the world want power. Most every leader of every nation wants power. And they get power and they want to control people. They want to take you under their wing. They want to manipulate. They want to bring people into bondage. And we see this down in Venezuela with Madura. You know, the guy is wicked. Supposedly he lost like 65 to 35%. He was the 35%. But he decided, oh, I'm still the president. I'm still in charge. It's, it's brutal because he wants power. And we see this throughout the world. We see it in churches. People want the, the power, the authority. But when power is tempered with the grace of God, that's a wonderful place to be. God gets the glory because it's not about a person. It's not about a place. It's not about a church. It's all about Jesus. And what was the power used for? Again, look at the middle of verse 20, uh, 33 here. They had great power, great grace. And the middle is to give witness to the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. Again, they're empowered to proclaim the gospel. It wasn't about power to get things their way and to do what they want to do. It was power to be a witness for Christ. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is what Jesus told him before he ascended. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. And so that's exactly what we see here. Pray that God would give you power to be a witness of God's grace, His love, to point people to Jesus. That's the only reason you should ever ask for His power, to point people to the Lord, not to yourself. Verse 34, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is uh, translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so again, this is a very particular time of koinonia. I mean, this was just a wonderful time of fellowship. It was something that was spontaneous. It was spirit-led. Nobody commanded them to do this. This is just a very beautiful, intimate time. Now, when Barnabas sells his land, it says that he takes it and he gives it to the apostles to be used by them as they saw fit. Uh, it must have been a tremendous blessing to all the disciples. Now, he did not do this 
because he wanted people to say, oh, Barnabas, he's so wonderful. Let's pat him on the back. Let's put up a thermometer. Let's ring a bell. Let's do something to acknowledge. No, he just did it because he was listening to the Lord, obeying the Lord. He wanted to bless others. And that's what true Christian giving is all about. No hype, no pressure, no applause, just a simple understanding that God has blessed us so much and we just want to be a blessing to others and that's what i love about the way so many of you give to calvary chapel here you recognize that you've been blessed by the lord and in turn you want to bless others i don't know who gives or what you give and i don't want to know because i don't want to treat anybody like because i had somebody years ago they said well you know how much i give don't you and i think no but he wanted me to know i was like no well i bet you noticed i stopped giving three months ago and I, I look at the books. I know what comes in, what goes out. And so I said, well, in fact, yesterday I looked at the books. And the last three months it's gone up. And he goes, that's impossible. I stopped giving three months ago. What do you do? I say, well, praise the Lord. God doesn't need you. You know, I, I don't want to know. I don't care. It's between you and the Lord. And that guy got whatever reward he thought he was going to get. And I don't know what reward it would be. Uh, slap in the wrist, maybe. But, look at Barnabas. But, why do I say that? Chapter 5, verse 1. We're not done yet. Chapter 5, verse 1. But, <laughs> here's the flip side. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife, also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now, a few things to take note of here. Ananias and Sapphira were totally free to do whatever they wanted to do with their money. They were free. It was your land, he says. You can do whatever you want with it. You can give it all. You can give part of it. You can do whatever you want. It's in your control. But the problem is they wanted the applause of men. They wanted to be recognized like Barnabas. Oh, Barnabas, he was so wonderful. Even though Barnabas wasn't looking for that, that's what these guys are looking for. And so when they sell their property, they pretended to give all the proceeds to the apostles. But in reality, they probably only gave like a third, maybe a half. They pocketed the rest. And Peter even says, it's okay if you want to do that, but don't say we've sold it and we're giving it all to you when they pocketed, you know, half of it or whatever. That's the problem. They wanted people to say, wow, isn't Ananias and Sapphira so generous? God gives Peter a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, 1 Corinthians 12. Paul says these are manifestations of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter their true motives. They're lying. They're deceiving. You know, they're doing something that's not right. And so Peter confronts him. He tells him, it was your money. You could have given as little or as much as you wanted. Take note of this, but to lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the eternal trinity father son holy spirit he is a person he is a he i gotta clarify in this day and age he is a he and he is not just a power source like some cults will say you know how do you lie to a power source can you lie to that light bulb that makes no sense no but you can lie to the holy spirit he says, you've not lied to the, you know, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. You've not lied to men, but to God, calling the Holy Spirit God. So that's one of the proof texts. There's many in the Bible, but here's a proof text. The Holy Spirit is God. So then, verse 5, as <laughs> soon as Peter says this, it's not funny. I don't know. I'm chuckling. But then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. So just this little group of people that hear Peter say this, oh no, they're in fear at this moment. Now, this is the only text in the Bible that speaks of someone being slain in the Spirit. Take note of that. 
I don't know how much is still going around, but for many years, you hear about all, oh, we're going to this Holy Spirit thing and we're all getting slain in the Spirit. Really, you're still alive. That doesn't make any sense. The Holy Spirit slays them. They're dead. It wasn't a good thing. It accomplished what God wanted. It brought a holy fear back into the hearts of the people. So God was showing his hatred for hypocrisy, for lying, for self-glorification. God wants us to be men and women of honesty, integrity, humility. He wants us to walk in innocence. God has given us such tremendous freedom, but we need to be careful not to abuse the freedom for selfish gain or ambition. A couple of Proverbs here. Proverbs 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9, 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy one is understanding it doesn't mean we need to be afraid of god but it means we should have a reverential awe for who god is he's not trying to scare us to death here but he wants us to have this reverential awe that produces a humble submission to the lord it's really living your life out of love for the lord it's more of a a fear of displeasing God. You know, a lot of people are afraid, oh, I better not do this because God's going to hit me upside the head with a two-by-four if I do. And that's not how you should look at it. That's the wrong type of fear. It's more of, oh, Lord, I don't want to do this. You know, I love you too much. I, don't, I, I can't give in to this. When you walk in God's love, when your heart is filled with His love, what does um, 1 John 4.18 say? God's perfect love casts out all fear. So I like the link what Paul says about the law in, in Galatians 3. He says the law is a tutor to bring us to Christ. So the law is an instructor, brings us to Christ. And once you come to Christ and you're in Christ, you're no longer under the tutor. You're not under the law. We're not lawless, but now the laws are in our hearts. In the same way, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But... When you come into that full love relationship with Jesus, His perfect love casts out all fear. And so now you're in a love relationship with Him. You know, I don't, I don't walk around the house fearing Elizabeth. Well, maybe I should more than I do, but... <laughs> I, I probably say things... Well, I know I say things I shouldn't say. But, you, you know, it's not that... It's a love relationship. It's not like, oh, no, I better not say something because she's going to take a... What do you call those things? Rolling pin in my head? <laughs> I deserve it, but no. It's a love relationship. So I, I, I don't do things because I love her. Same with the Lord. He doesn't want us to be afraid of Him, but He wants us to walk in love. And so the fear that came upon the people at this time was to ultimately drive them closer to the Lord. Again, when you feel like, oh, this is pushing me away from God, that's the enemy. Satan wants to drive you away from the Lord. The Holy Spirit brings conviction into our lives because he wants us to draw near to the Lord. He wants us to realize, you can't do this on your own, Jeff. You need to trust me. You need to walk in my strength, in my love. It also shows us here that God is serious about sin. These, this is the first example of this. They sinned. God struck them down. How serious is God you know, looking at sin, well, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die for our sins. That's how serious it is with the Lord. Now look at verse 6. And the young men arose, wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. I don't know why I chuckle at these things, but it's got a, in my mind I'm picturing what they're doing. So they wrap him up, they haul him out, they bury him. Verse 7, now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, so she must have been taking the extra money she had in her pocket, purse, and she's out shopping. You know, buying some nice jewelry or something. Sorry, I'm not trying to read anything into the Bible here. But three hours later, when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the lamb for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you've agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in, 
They just finished burying her husband, and they found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. And I'm wondering, man, I wonder if they're taking their time this time. Man, we don't want to show back up and have to bury another body. This could go on all day. A bunch of hypocrites here in this church. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. I mean, aren't you glad this is a one-time event? This is a one-time event. And, you know, I joke about it, but, you know, if this was still going on, I don't know how many of us would drop dead at the foot of the you know, doorway coming into church. You know, none of us are perfect, but God is establishing something very, very important here. And so people are dropping here, these, this couple. But the Bible, again, one-time events. The Bible is full of one-time events. We saw it in Exodus. One-time event. God tells Moses, okay, we're establishing Passover. I'm going to send a death angel over. So here's the remedy. You put blood on the lintel and the doorposts of your house. When the death angel passes over, it has to be the blood of the lamb, Passover lamb. When the death angel passes over, he sees the blood, you're spared. If there's no blood, you're dead. That was a one-time event. Only happened that first Passover. A little bit later on, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's two oldest sons. They go into the tabernacle. They offer up profane fire, it says before the Lord. God <laughs> strikes them dead. One-time event. Um, Korah and his men, they're opposing Moses and Aaron. And so they, the next day they show up and there's like 250 of them all complaining and grumbling against Moses. God opens up the ground. They all fall in. God closes the ground. That's the end of that story. One time event. I haven't heard of that happening lately. And so praise the Lord. Jesus came. He died once and for all, for all of our sins. One time event. He's not getting re crucified every Sunday or anytime we take communion. He died once and for all for all of our sins. The Holy Spirit coming down, you know, coming on the day of Pentecost, rushing, mighty wind, little flames of fire over all their heads. One time event. Don't get disappointed when you look in the mirror and there's no little flame over your head. It was a one time event. Doesn't happen all the time. So there's great fear upon all the church, because they're realizing sin is serious. We need to have a holy reverence for God. We need to take sin seriously, not just pawn it off like, oh, no big deal. Everybody's doing it. Be careful. You don't want to grieve or quench the Spirit. Verse 12, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, that's on the uh, south side of the Temple Mount. They, uh, yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. Now, I certainly believe God still heals. He performs great and marvelous miracles in the world today. But at the same time, those first apostles, man, they were used in powerful ways. They were anointed by the Lord in tremendous ways. In a sense, they were just in the right place at the right time. And God was doing these amazing things through them. But don't think it was only the apostles, because we'll see Philip, a table waiter, God will use him to do miraculous things as well. He can use any of us, because it's not us, it's Jesus working in us and through us. And so he can have you, I'm going to pray for this person, you know, I'm going to lay hands on them. You know, it's not me, I can't heal anybody. I've seen the Lord heal people just praying over them, but it's not me. I've seen a lot of people not healed when I pray over them. And I just say, it's not me. <laughs> it's not my, we've got to work my faith up. No, God is sovereign. He does what he wants, how he wants, but he'll use you and me to come alongside and pray for people. But this is just a really amazing time. It didn't die off when the apostles died off. That's cessationism. God still works miraculously today. Look at verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. This is crazy. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities in Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. And again, the reason they were all healed was not to glorify the apostles, but it was to validate the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. He's risen from the dead. He's the one doing this. 
That's why we're giving you the gospel, the good news. He was doing the healing, not Peter. Peter's not like, oh, I've got to make sure the sun's out before I go walking down the street so they can get healed with my shadow. I mean, this is a sovereign work of God here. But what an awesome time. Just his you know, shadow passing over people and, and people could be healed. There's no explanation for this other than the total, complete grace of God working in them and through them. It's like when the Apostle Paul, we read about Paul working as a tent maker. So in the day, it's hot, he's sweating, he's making tents. At night, he's giving the gospel, teaching. But during the day, he's got these headbands on, he's got these handkerchiefs, he's tossing them to the side, dirty, you know, sweat, tossing them down. It says, and we'll see this later in Acts, people are grabbing those snot rags, taking them home, and people are getting healed. And demons are cast out of people with his sweatbands. Now, Paul didn't think, well, you know what? I don't have to work so hard at being a tent maker. I'll start cutting these little sweatbands up. I'll start selling them for 20 shekels apiece. I got a gig going. No, that's not what they did. Paul himself prayed three times that God would heal him. And you know what God told him? Basically, no. He says, for my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made pe perfect in your weakness. And Paul accepted that. Okay, I'd rather be weak. I'd rather have this infirmity just so that the grace of God would be upon me. He understood. It's not about me. It's about honoring the Lord. A couple other examples. Look at Timothy. That's Paul's right-hand man, his son in the faith. What does he tell Timothy? Because Timothy kept having ongoing stomach ailments. Today he would say, why don't you take a little Pepto-Bismol for your frequent stomach ailments? He tells him, drink a little wine for your frequent stomach ailments because there's medicinal value in drinking a little wine. Why didn't Paul just lay hands on him and heal him? Because that, Paul can't. None of us can. It's God working in us and through us. And Paul understood that. I'm sure he prayed Lord, I pray you'd heal this because Timothy's getting bogged down with this frequent stomach problem. God said, no, give him a little wine for his frequent ailments. And here's another one. He tells Timothy, you know what? One of our right-hand men, his name is Trophimus. He's been doing a lot of ministry, but you know what? I had to leave him behind sick in my Miletus. Why didn't Paul just touch him and heal him? Because Paul can't. So I know people have chronic pain, chronic illness, whatever situation they were born with, and they've had people say, all you need is more faith and you'll be healed. And they get, they get beat up. Usually they end up beating themselves up. Oh, it's my lack of faith. That's why I'm not healed. We looked at the guy sitting at the gate beautiful. 40 years it says he was there. Every day, lay him at the gate beautiful. He, wasn't, he didn't have any faith to be healed. Peter and John walk up to him. And he's like hoping for a handout. He wanted just some shekels from them or something. And Peter says, I don't have any silver and gold, but I have. I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. The guy wasn't even looking for a healing. Zero faith, but God healed him. That's God. So don't limit him by, well, if I just work my faith up to this level, and if it's not at this level, it's my fault I'm not being healed. It's my fault that I'm not walking. It's my fault. No. Rest in who God created you to be. God's the one that told Moses, when Moses, I got the speech impediment, I'm, I don't talk too good. And God, God's like, who made the blind? Who made the lame? Is it not I? When they came to the, the disciples come to the guy and he was born blind and they asked Jesus, why is this guy blind? Is it because of his sin? Well, <laughs> he was born that way. Was it his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus said, neither. That the glory of God would be revealed here. And he healed him. It was for God's glory. It wasn't because of them working up their faith to a certain level. God does what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. And we rest in the fact that he loves us. And he knows what is best for us. And I'm way off base here. So let me see if I can reel this back in. Um, it's just saying, Lord, whatever you want to do. And whatever God does in your life, just realize He loves you. 
Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for your good. It's for your good and for His glory. Never forget that. Okay, we'll stop here. Lord willing, we'll pick up next time in uh, verse 17, and we'll see, because they prayed for boldness, give us strength to go out and preach the gospel, they get arrested again. <laughs> God didn't say, okay, you're good now, just go out and do it, no problem. They get arrested, this time they'll get beat up a little bit. Last time they were just chewed out, now they'll get beat up, but they'll still rejoice because they're doing exactly what God called them to do. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you that you're on the throne. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. Lord, we don't always understand why certain things happen to us, but Lord, we thank you that you always have a great plan and a purpose, even in the midst of our trials, our struggles, our difficulties, Lord, and when we get through to the other side of the long, dark tunnel, sometimes it seems like there is no end. But Lord, when we see the light at the end of the tunnel, we thank you that you are there with us every step of the way. You're the one that gives us the victory. It's because we are in Christ that we realize we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. And even if we get beat up, even if we die as a martyr, like many of our brothers and sisters in Christ have died in their testimony of you, they were instantly in your presence. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so, Lord, only you know what each of us will face this coming week. Only you know what this country is going to face come November. And, Lord, we pray that we would walk in wisdom and knowledge, and have discernment, to be men and women who are not ashamed of the gospel, that we would stand up for what is right, and we would give you all the glory, because it's really not about us, it's all about Jesus. And so Father, may you fill us up overflowing with your Holy Spirit once again, so that we can walk in your ways and minister your goodness, your grace, your love, your truth to those that we come across this week. May you get all the glory, for you alone are worthy. And I thank you for all my brothers and sisters that are here. Lord, I pray that you would use us to encourage, exhort other brothers and sisters around us that we see who are compromising, who are getting beat up by the enemy, who are wanting to throw in the towel. Lord, we pray that you would use us to come alongside of others to point them back to you, Jesus. You are this world's only hope. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.